Hey, future doctors. Thanks for joining me on Spoonful of Sugar, a podcast made for medical students by medical students to help the medicine go down. My name is Rhea Mulherker. I'm currently a medicine intern in Philadelphia, and I will be your host today. I want to start off by thanking you guys so much for the amazing feedback that we've been getting for Spoonful of Sugar. Uh, to all of the students who have rated, subscribed, followed, shared our posts, um, if you're listening, um, you know, thank you so much. We truly appreciate your support. This is really a podcast that was created for medical students, and we want to help you however we can. I think for us, uh, the best thing that we can do is to continue to release episodes on a regular basis and cover the topics that you guys are interested in hearing. Um, And so I always encourage you guys to let us know, whether it's through Instagram, through the website, whatever it is, reach out and let us know what topics you want us to cover, and we will. The topic of today's episode is actually uh, dermatological conditions, and it's something that was requested by popular demand. Uh, Several people have reached out asking me to cover this topic, and so here we are. Uh, Today's episode, we're going to talk about benign dermatological conditions. Obviously, this is going to be a really challenging topic to discuss on the podcast platform. Dermatology is something that requires um, pictures, images to go along with it. Um, But nonetheless, I think that it's still possible for us to review some key concepts about dermatological conditions by reviewing uh, important vocabulary around them and reviewing how they are actually asked. Sometimes you will find, it's rare, but you will find question stems that instead of a picture, you just get a description, a verbal description of the skin issue. Uh, And so it is important to familiarize yourself with the terminology and the vocabulary um, that surrounds these diseases. So as you go through this episode, uh, if you are sitting at a desk uh, or next to a computer, I certainly encourage you to follow along the conditions we discuss with your books or even a Google search, as I mentioned, names of conditions. Um, But if not, not to worry, you can always, you know, revisit that and uh, look at pictures later. Um, Let's just tune in and, you know, get started. I think it's going to be important, regardless of whether you're looking at pictures or not, to understand some of the verbs uh, and the ways that these diseases present. So in this episode, the way I'm going to organize it, first, I'm going to start by reviewing specific terms that you should be familiar with. Um, These are descriptions that will be used in the question stems themselves on the board exams. And you'll also need to be familiar with these terms uh, when you're describing physical exams in the future uh, to your teams. So we'll go through kind of basic terms first, and then we'll go through some common benign dermatological conditions. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to cover all of them because there are just so many, uh, but I am going to try to hit some of the more common ones that you should definitely be familiar with. Also, I do want to point out in this episode, we're only going to be covering benign conditions. If you would like an overview of skin cancer, um, we actually did kind of cover some of the different types of skin cancer and key topics related to that in season one, episode 16 on cancer epidemiology. Uh, So for some of the malignant conditions, I would recommend tuning into that episode. And in today's episode, we'll just be talking about benign conditions. So first of all, I want to start off by discussing some basic vocabulary that's associated with these diseases. I'm going to start by presenting a series of terms, and I'm going to present them kind of as dichotomies, so two different terms, and think about what they mean to you and what the difference is between them. The first two terms are macule and patch. Do you know what what macule and patch refers to and what the difference is? So by definition, both macule and patch refer to flat lesions, okay? These lesions are flat and kind of smooth across the top of the skin. The difference between them is the size. So macules are going to be lesions smaller than one centimeter in diameter, and a patch is going to be larger than one centimeter. The next two terms I want to think about in juxtaposition are papule versus plaque. Do you know the difference between a papule and a plaque? Again, both of these are referring to raised solid lesions. So whereas the macule and patch were flat against the skin, these are going to be more raised. And the same, it's the same difference. So a papule is less than one centimeter and a plaque is greater than one centimeter. And then finally, I want you to think about vesicles versus boule. Do you guys know the similarity and differences between them? 
So these are both going to be raised fluid containing lesions that are actually blisters. Okay. So they contain fluid within them and you know, going right along our theme of size, vesicles are going to be less than one centimeter and bullae are going to be greater than one centimeter. Uh, let's just talk about some common viral conditions with different types of rashes. So can you think of a common viral condition that presents with a maculopapular rash? There's quite a few examples, but one great classic example is rubella or German measles. It's going to present with a maculopapular rash. Uh, how about those classic umbilicated papules? Umbilicated papules are really, really specific. Do you guys know when they, those are found? Molluscum contagiosum. Uh, remember, that's a viral disease often seen in children caused by pox virus. They present with that classic umbilicated papule. And then what about vesicular lesions? What's a great example of vesicular, a, a virus causing vesicular lesions? Varicella zoster or chicken pox. And remember, these classically present with a vesicular rash all in different stages. Let's move on now. Um, very good job with that vocabulary. Let's move on to some common dermatological findings on basically everyone's skin. So let's start by talking about freckles. What are freckles or what is the pathophysiology of freckles? Do you guys know? So think about melanosomes versus melanocytes. In freckles, we're actually going to see an increased number of melanosomes, but melanocytes are going to be normal. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. Freckles, we just see increased melanosomes. That is in contrast to nevi. Uh, the singular is nevus, also known as a mole. Do you guys know the pathophysiology of moles or nevi? So unlike freckles, these are actually going to be increased number of melanocytes as opposed to the melanosomes. So freckles, we see increased melanosomes. Moles, we see increased melanocytes. And then moles are actually classified into three different, um, three different categories. Do you guys know what they are? It kind of has to do with where they are located in the layer of the skin. So there are junctional nevi, compound nevi, and intradermal nevi. We're going to talk about all of these briefly, but I'd first like to start by reviewing the different layers of the skin. Do you guys remember what the three basic layers of the skin are? So there's epidermis, dermis, and then there's subcutaneous fat, which is made up of the hypodermis and the subcutis. What are the layers of the epidermis? I'll give you a hint. There's a... There are five different layers, and there's a great mnemonic that reminds me of Katy Perry. So I'll start with the mnemonic because I think it's easier to remember. The, the mnemonic is Californians like girls in string bikinis. Californians, C, like, L, girls, G, in string, S, bikinis, B. So... Let's translate that then to the five layers of the epidermis, which are stratum corneum, C, stratum lucidum, L, stratum granulosum, G, stratum spinosum, S, and stratum basale, B. So we have corneum, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, and basale. Um, and I really think it's easier to just remember the mnemonic, Californians like girls in string bikinis. Uh, and then that'll translate into the actual scientific words quite easily for you. So those are the five layers of the epidermis. And remember that the epidermis is the top layer of the skin, followed by the dermis and then the subcutaneous fat. So a lot of the dermatological conditions that we're discussing are going to be affecting the epidermis and dermis or the junction. So when we talk about the different type of nevi, the first type I want to discuss is junctional nevi. And as you can guess, they are found right at that dermo-epidermal junction. So between those top two layers of skin. And do you guys know how junctional nevi usually appear? So these are right at kind of like the top of that junction. And so they're going to be flat and they're going to be darker in color. They're going to tend to be black, brown. They'll be darker in the center. Now, if some of the cells start to extend, if some of the melanocytes start to extend deeper into the dermis, we're going to get what we call compound nevi. 
So these start to appear raised now. They're still uniform and they're going to be tan brown in color, so a little bit lighter in color. And then finally, if all the melanocytes are in the dermis, then we get what are called intradermal nevi, and these are going to be more dome-shaped and pedunculated. So basically, the three types of nevi are junctional, compound, and intradermal, and it has to do with where the melanocytes are located. So the deeper we go, the more raised and dome-shaped the nevi are in appearance. Does that make sense? I guess I can't really get a reply from you guys, but I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, I would really encourage you to listen to that part again or perhaps even look up a picture. Let's move on then and talk about a callus. Do you guys know what the pathophysiology of a callus is? Think about calluses on people's hands if they're weightlifting or the calluses at the tips of people's fingers if they're playing guitar. So these basically result from increased thickness of the stratum corneum. Remember that first layer of the skin, the Californians. Um, and do you guys know what another term for that is? Increase in thickness of the stratum corneum. This is called hyperkeratosis because the stratum corneum really just contains keratin. And so we see an increase in the, in the composition of that stratum corneum. We're seeing increased keratin, thus hyperkeratosis. And that's what a callus is. Well, how about comedones? What are comedones? As I'm saying this, I realize I don't actually know how to pronounce the word comedones. Um, I did try to do a quick YouTube search, but none of the three videos I watched, um, they all had three different pronunciations. So I still don't know the answer. I'm going to have to have you guys defer to all the dermatologists out there. Um, but anyway, comedones, C-O-M-E-D-O-N-E-S. Do you guys know what these are? So basically, these are just skin pores that are filled with stuff, and these are the things we look at on our own faces and kind of worry about. They can be open or closed. And do you guys know another name for open comedone? So this is a blackhead. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar with these on our own skin. Um, an open comedone is also known as a blackhead. Uh, the way I remember that is just by thinking about opening into an abyss of black. Um, but if you want to be less depressing, you can definitely think about the actual mechanism. Basically, all the debris within that skin pore is going to get oxidized, and that causes it to turn black. And so that's why open comedones are black in color, and they're called blackheads. And then closed comedones, you can then infer, are what, are, what do you think they are? Whiteheads. So closed comedones are going to be whiteheads. Um, and the way I think of this is just boarded up. It's like a white wall. So closed comedones are whiteheads, and then open are blackheads. These are actually non-inflammatory lesions, but they can inflame and cause acne. So that's kind of a great segue to discuss a very common dermatological condition known as acne. And there's a few different types of acne. For the purposes of step one, you don't have to be super familiar, but the different types are comedonal, inflammatory, there's nodular, there's also nodulocystic. And really depending on which type of acne, there's going to be different treatment schemes. But do you guys know some of the most common agents we use to treat acne? So benzoyl peroxide is definitely one. We can sometimes use antibiotics, uh, topical or oral. And then we can also use retinoids or vitamin A. And this can also be topical or oral. Do you guys know what you have to be really careful about when you're giving vitamin A, especially to teenage women? So pregnancy, because vitamin A is a super horrible teratogen. Um, and so women who are taking vitamin A for acne treatment need to usually be on um, birth control when they're, when they're taking it because it's so teratogenic. So let's move on then and continue talking about some inflammatory conditions. And let me give you guys a question stem for this next one. So let's say a four-year-old child comes into the doctor has erythematous pyretic eruption along the flexor surfaces. This includes the antecubital fossa as well as behind the knees. And this child's mom says he used to have a similar looking rash on his cheeks as a baby. Do you guys know what diagnosis I'm going for here? So this condition is going to be atopic dermatitis or eczema. Um, the, the lesions that you see with eczema or atopic dermatitis are often described as erythematous plaques, and they tend to be very itchy or pruritic. 
This condition is very commonly associated with a bunch of other atopic conditions. So think asthma, allergic rhinitis, food allergies. Kids who have eczema are usually going to be asthmatic and have allergies to everything. It's kind of a very common um, trio of conditions. And the reason we see that is because all of these conditions are associated with an increased serum IgE. So do you guys know what microscopic finding is associated with eczema? If you were to take a skin biopsy and look at that under a microscope, what would you see? So you're most likely going to see edema or an accumulation of fluid in the intercellular spaces of the epidermis. And does anybody know a, a technical term for that in dermatology? So this is called spongiosis or edema in those intercellular spaces of the epidermis. It's called spongiosis and it's something that you'll see in eczema. Let's move on then to a second case. So what if an adult patient comes in and has papules and plaques that are associated with silvery scaling located over his knees and elbows? He says that whenever he scratches at those scales, there's actually some really tiny pinpoint spots of bleeding. When you do a physical exam on him, you notice that his nails are also pitted, so he has nail pitting, um, and he has some enlargement of his interphalangeal joints. What diagnosis am I going for here? Psoriasis, very good. Uh, that silvery scaling is kind of a key descriptor for psoriasis. And do you guys know what that pinpoint bleeding I described, what's up with that? So it's important because it has a name. It's called the Auspitz sign. And it, it's basically tiny pinpoint spots of bleeding whenever those scales are scratched off. It's seen in psoriasis. And do you guys know what microscopic findings you would see with psoriasis? So there's some very fancy words here. We see acanthosis with parakeratotic scaling, and we also see a finding called Monroe microabscesses. Let's slow down and break all that down. So what's acanthosis? Acanthosis is epidermal hyperplasia. So basically increased um, layering of the stratum spinosum. Parakeratosis is whenever we have nuclei retained in the stratum corneum. It's odd to see nuclei in the stratum corneum because it's usually just made up of keratin, but that's why we see parakeratosis in psoriasis. And then that last finding is Monroe microabscesses. Do you know what these are referring to? So you'll also see neutrophils in the stratum corneum associated with inflammation. Um, and the way you can remember this is easy. Abscesses are always going to have neutrophils. And so Monroe abs microabscesses are no different. And we see neutrophils in the stratum corneum. So acanthosis, parakeratotic scaling, as well as uh, Monroe microabscesses are just some microscopic findings to be familiar with for psoriasis. And what's the treatment for psoriasis? So usually in any dermatological condition, uh, topical steroids are not going to be a wrong answer. So you can definitely use um, steroids to treat uh, to treat psoriasis. Um, but then the other one, the reason I'm asking, uh, you can also use a topical vitamin D analog called calcipotriene for, for treatment of psoriasis. Now, next case, what if you're taking the test and they show a picture of an adult male with erythematous, greasy looking plaques along his beard, eyebrows, hairline? Do you know what the diagnosis is here? So this is kind of a classic presentation of seborrheic dermatitis. Um, and patients with this condition usually tend to have this erythematous rash that has a greasy appearance, and it tends to be along the hair follicles. Any idea why? It's because they're rich in sebaceous glands, and it kind of grow, goes with that greasy appearance. Do you guys know what infection is associated with seborrheic dermatitis? It's going to be malassezia infection. Very good. Um, and then what's the treatment for, for this? So antifungals, because malassezia is a species of fungi, uh, as well as corticosteroids. So remember, if they show you a picture of a man and he has a rash kind of like along his eyebrows, hairline, beard, think about seborrheic uh, dermatitis. It's associated with malassezia, tends to be located near sebaceous glands. 
Moving on now, there's two types of benign vascular conditions that I'd like to discuss with you guys. Um, these are commonly tested, and in pictures, they'll the vascular tumors are going to look like really well demarcated red colored bumps. Okay, and these basically just correspond to growth of blood vessels. So the first one I want to discuss usually shows up in infants, uh, usually within a few weeks of birth. It tends to grow rapidly, and then it regresses over a period of years. Do you guys know what diagnosis I'm going for here? So this is a strawberry hemangioma, okay? Um, it's it's going to look, it can even look pretty scary in young children, but basically they'll show you a picture of an infant with a very large red hemangioma. Um, and in these questions, sometimes the parents are going to be freaking out. They're going to ask if their kid needs surgical intervention. What would you tell them? The answer is really reassurance. Um, these should actually regress later in childhood, usually by age five to eight years old. Um, and so they tend to go away on their own and usually no intervention is needed. The other type I want to describe is a capillary hemangioma, which is actually usually seen in adults rather than children. These can are usually very small um, and adults may actually have multiple of these all over their body. Do you know what the diagnosis is here? Cherry hemangiomas. These are very commonly seen on especially Caucasian adults. Do these regress over time like strawberry hemangiomas? No, the answer is no. These usually stay forever. So do we need to do any kind of intervention on them? The answer is also no, because these are benign, so they do not require any in intervention. The way I remember the difference between strawberry and cherry hemangiomas is that strawberries are sweeter than cherries. And so I kind of think children are sweeter than adults, so these happen in children, and they'll go away. So how sweet is that? So that's how I kind of remember the difference between strawberries and cherry hemangiomas. But again, both of these are named after fruit, so they really can't be that bad. Now, this next condition is also another commonly tested one, and it's often described as pruritic, purple, polygonal, planar, papules, and plaques. Do you know the diagnosis here? So this is lichen planus, um, and what I just stated to you, the pruritic, purple, polygonal, planar, papules, and plaques. Wow, that is really a tongue twister. These are described in first aid as the six Ps of lichen planus. And do you guys know what the microscopic findings are? Like, what's the actual pathophysiology of lichen planus? Remember, this is the one where you get sawtooth infiltration of lymphocytes at the dermal epidermal junction. And what infection is associated with lichen planus? So just think about this. If you see a purple polygonal rash, the patient may have a history of hepatitis C. Now, let us conclude with the very last set of conditions that I want to talk about. These are both serious conditions, and these are blistering skin disorders, okay? They're both autoimmune diseases, and they actually both represent type 2 hypersensitivity reactions where we have IgG antibodies forming against some component of the skin. Do you guys know what two conditions I'm talking about just by that brief description? So I'm going to be discussing pemphigus vulgaris and bullous pemphigoid diseases. Um, if you didn't know that, that's totally fine. We're going to just talk about them both in depth right now. Um, these are very easy to confuse with each other, and so I'm going to go into them a little bit more in depth. So between these two, pemphigus vulgaris and bullous pemphigoid, do you know which is more severe? Definitely uh, pemphigus vulgaris. This is potentially fatal. And what's the actual pathophys? What happens in pemphigus vulgaris? In pemphigus vulgaris, the IgG antibody that we have is against desmoglein, which is a component of desmosomes. Now, what do desmosomes normally do? Normally, uh, desmosomes are located between the cells of the epidermis. They actually connect the keratinocytes to the stratum spinosum. Uh, so when we have antibodies against the desmoglein, which is a component of the desmosomes, the desmosomes obviously don't work correctly. And what happens is you form these flaccid intraepidermal bullae. You get separation of keratinocytes within the epidermis. 
If you were to look at that under a microscope, what you would see is what's called a row of tombstones. Um, it's a row of tombstone appearance because of the separation that you see from those keratinocytes. And then there are some unique features in Pemphigus vulgaris that distinguish it from bullous pemphigoid. So are there any physical exam findings you can think of that are unique to Pemphigus vulgaris? So oral mucosal involvement is only seen in Pemphigus vulgaris. Okay, remember that Pemphigus vulgaris is more vulgar, it's more serious, it's more fatal. So this is going to involve the oral mucosa as well. And what's another finding in Pemphigus vulgaris that's not in bullous pemphigoid? There's something called the Nikolsky sign. Do you guys know what Nikolsky sign is? Basically, just by breaking the, just by rubbing your fingers along the blisters, you can kind of break them apart and cause them to glisten at the bottom. The reason this is important to remember is that the capsule of the blister in bullous pemphigoid is going to be a lot weaker than that of pemphigus vulgaris. And so these are very, you know, the capsule of that blister is very thin. It's very easily broken. And that's Nikolsky sign. And you'll actually have new blisters appear just with gentle traction and rubbing. The last thing I want to say for pemphigus vulgaris is that it's really important to be familiar with the findings that we see when we look under immunofluorescence. And do you guys know what what it looks like on immunofluorescence for pemphigus vulgaris. So we see a reticular or net-like pattern. Reticular just means net-like. And basically think of it as desmosomes connect a bunch of neighboring cells within the epidermis. So imagine kind of a net connecting all those cells and you'll see a reticular pattern on immunofluorescence. And then Let's move on then to talk about bullous pemphigoid and con kind of contrast that with what we just discussed for pemphigus vulgaris. So what is the pathophysiology of bullous pemphigoid? What are the antibodies against? In bullous pemphigoid, we see IgG antibodies directed against hemidesmosomes. Now, hemidesmosomes, what's their normal function? So these are going to connect the epidermal basement membrane. Okay, so think of these as, as this connecting the cells of the epidermis to the basement membrane. How do we differentiate from pemphigus vulgaris? So first of all, the blisters in bullous pemphigoid are going to be more tense. Think of it this way. The defect in bullous pemphigoid is lower than um, than that in pemphigus vulgaris. In bullous pemphigoid, the defect is at the level of the basement membrane. And so these cells are actually going to have, or these blisters are actually going to have a thicker capsule around them. And so the blisters tend to be more tense, and the Nikolsky sign is negative because they're not easily ruptured, like in pemphigus vulgaris. And then finally, the oral mucosa is not involved for bullous pemphigoid. And do you guys know what pattern we see on immunofluorescence for bullous pemphigoid? So we see a linear pattern. Remember, in pemphigus vulgaris, it was a reticular pattern on air immunofluorescence. It was net-like. In bullous pemphigoid, it's going to be a linear pattern. Think of it as a line kind of right at the dermal epidermal junction, and that's where the defect is. That's where the hemidesmosomes are attacked. So great job um, getting through pemphigus vulgaris versus bullous pemphigoid. Um, just remember, if you're having trouble picking between the two on the test, that pemphigus vulgaris is kind of worse in every way. Now, other than pemphigus vulgaris, can you think of any other conditions where you see that positive Nikolsky sign? So remember, Nikolsky sign happens when the blisters are very, very fragile, and we see separation of the epidermis just by manually stroking the skin. So this can be seen in staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. It can also be seen in drug reactions like erythema multiforme. So very good. Excellent job, guys. That kind of concludes all of the conditions that I wanted to go over in this episode. I know we did not hit nearly all of the derm conditions because there's just so many, but I tried to hit some of the more commonly tested ones and address the important recurring concepts within those. 
So again, I want to emphasize that this episode was very, very limited, not only in scope, but also because we couldn't show you guys any images. So if you didn't have a chance to follow along with images while you were listening, I highly encourage you to go to your books at your, you know, when you next have a chance and kind of look at the pictures associated with all of these conditions, just to ingrain them in your mind and ingrain them in your memory. Um, or, you know, you can always listen to this episode again and follow along with a Google search or something like that. So anyway, I really hope this episode was beneficial to you guys. Um, as I said at the beginning, this was a topic that I was asked by multiple people to address. Um, and it's definitely challenging uh, because derm depends so heavily on pictures. But I hope that it was beneficial to you. I hope that, you know, we address some things that are commonly tested, addressed some topics that are very important to be familiar with as you move forward um, to the board exams as well as to the wards. Um, hopefully you feel a little bit more comfortable describing the physical exam findings with rashes as well. So as always, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can always go to spoonfulofsugar.org and post them under the link for this episode. That's kind of an area meant to discuss errors or questions or anything, any issues with each episode. If you're finding our episodes helpful, I really encourage you to subscribe to us, give us a rating or review, follow us on social media. Uh, I have actually started being a little more active on Instagram with some practice questions. So who knows, you know, in the next few weeks, we might see questions about some of the conditions that I described in this episode on the Instagram. So definitely encourage you to follow along there. Um, and then as always, if there's any topics that cause you to have SOS levels of panic, get in touch. Um, we love to help you guys out with a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down.